through us in this generation, Lord. I command the strongholds to break. I command the mountains to move. I decree and declare every obstacle is being pushed out of the way. And Lord, I decree and declare your people are moving forward right now, Lord Jesus, in your precious name. Lord, I speak a release of the breaker anointing in this room because the God of the breakthrough is walking amongst us right now. Lord Jesus, I decree and declare that everything that you are is being released in this room right now because you're walking in this room. Lord, I decree and declare that the supernatural is invading the natural. Lord, I ask today that you would tear down the second heaven. Lord, rip it like a garment out of the way. And Lord Jesus, may you pull the first and third heavens together. And Lord, this day may we hear in the realm of the Spirit. May we see in the realm of the Spirit. May we smell the fragrance of the realm of the Spirit. May we taste and see that you are good. May we touch the face of the God of Jacob. I decree and declare a new dimension in the Lord is coming in this room. And breakthrough is being released. And I decree and declare this day this house is unshackled from the chains of the past. And I declare everybody in this house is unshackled from the chains of the past. Even as I stood waiting to put on the microphone, the enemy brought an accusation from my past. In the name of Jesus, I decree and declare the legal rights that the enemy has to accuse us before the throne of God are covered in the blood of Jesus right now. Lord, you said if we confess our sin, you're faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Lord, we ask that you would take away all the material that the enemy can use to accuse us with before the throne. And Lord Jesus, I just decree and declare a new day, a new awakening, the Hebrew number eight over this house. Lord, I declare every blessing, every declaration every provision of the Hebrew year 5783 is beginning to be poured out over your people right now. And the things the enemy has hindered are now being poured out in abundance. Lord Jesus, for your people in this room right now and listening to the broadcast, I declare every word curse that's ever been spoken against them is broken through the blood of Jesus. I declare you're coming out of agreement with every bitter root judgment and every negative word you've spoken over yourself in the name of Jesus. I declare over you in the name of Jesus every hindrance to intimacy with Jesus is being removed from your life jealously by the Spirit of the living God. I decree and declare faith is welling up within you because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. I declare over you right now you're standing in faith. You're moving into your greatest hour in the Lord. He saves the best wine for last. I declare you didn't miss the ministry. You didn't miss the calling. You didn't miss God's plan for your life. The latter house will be so much greater than the former house and His glory is being poured out over you right now. Amen. <laughs> And I just bless you in the name of Jesus. I declare that God is bringing you into a deeper, more intimate, new walk with Him. But I decree and declare in it, He's stripping away all the old layers and everything that's hindered you. I decree and declare as you've cried out to the Lord for a new walk, a fresh anointing, a new dimension. I decree and declare the Spirit of God is saying to you this day that you can't walk the way you used to in the previous seasons. And I decree and declare you will not walk the way you used to. You will walk as the head and not the tail. You will walk above and not beneath. You will walk empowered and not beaten. You will walk in victory. You're not a victim in the name of Jesus. And I declare a shame over your life in the name of Jesus right now. I declare a shift over you. The Lord said there's people in this room right now that are on the verge of a shift. And I hear the Lord saying, I just want you to step, move forward, step over the threshold because there's something new that I'm releasing for you right now. The Lord says, I'm so tired of you being beaten down and held back. The Lord says, I'm so tired of the depression and oppression being so common amongst my people when I'm pouring out over them the Isaiah 61 anointing to set the captives free and set at liberty those who sit in darkness. The Lord says, first I'm setting my bride free and then she is going to give them beauty for ashes and joy for mourning and a garment of praise in the place of the spirit of despair. The Lord says, I'm giving my people a new voice because they felt like they haven't had one. And they're going to speak in the realm of the spirit like never before. The Lord said, I'm about to speak to you like never before. I'm going to give you words. The Lord says, when I share my word with you, release my word and my timing and my way. The Lord says, everything is about to change. 
He says, everything is about to change. But the Lord said, if everything's going to change, I need you to change with it. I'm breaking the paradigms in the way that you used to see things. I'm even breaking the way that you thought you encounter me. Because he says, the Lord, I'm doing a new thing. The Lord says, I decree it and declare it before I bring it forth. He says, forget the past. Let go of the former things. For behold, I'm doing a new thing. I'm making streams in the desert and rivers in the wasteland. Do you not perceive what I'm doing? The Lord says, he who has ears, let him hear. He who has eyes, let him see. Because the Lord says, I'm beginning to do something in this generation I've done in no other. The Lord says the church at the end of the age will look like no other church in any, any previous generation because I'm taking the shackles and the chains off and they will walk as I am so they are in the earth. They're going to take me at my word and they're going to do greater things than what I did because intimacy with me is going to fuel everything that they do. The Lord says I'm tearing down the old structure and I'm doing a new thing. The Lord said that's not only for the church, that's for the ecclesia. The Lord said, I am tearing everything down and I'm building something new. Who is willing to be torn down so that I can build you up the way that I desire? The Lord said, I am the Lord your God. Don't put boundaries on me. Don't tell me what you will do and what you won't do. Don't tell me what little block of time that I am able to fit into in your schedule. I am your schedule. And I will show you that I am the I am Amen. as you surrender everything to me. Hallelujah. Woo, thank you, Lord. How many received the word of the Lord this morning? Oh, hallelujah. How many know that we serve a mighty God who will be hindered no longer? Oh, I don't think you heard me. How many know that we serve a mighty God who will be hindered no longer? Hallelujah. He says, the enemy isn't going to hinder me, but my people aren't going to hinder me any longer either. The Lord said, for those that are willing to completely surrender to me and give everything to me, the Lord said, I am going to use them beyond what their eye has ever seen or ear heard nor their sanctified imagination has ever ever dared to imagine. God says, I'm going to use them in those ways. How many received that in the Lord this morning? Hallelujah. There's just a pregnancy in the spirit in the atmosphere of this place right now. When there's a pregnancy in the realm of the spirit, all things are possible. And Holy Spirit, I just ask right now that just as you just moved over Mary and put the holy embryo within her, because she said, let it be unto me according to thy word. Holy Spirit, I ask that you'll move over people this morning that hear this word. And Holy Spirit, I ask for a pregnancy of the spirit of God in their spiritual womb. And Lord Jesus, I decree and declare a pregnancy is going to lead to travail and to birthing. And then, hallelujah, Lord, something amazing is going to come forth, Lord. Lord, your people have been crying out, when, Lord, are you going to do this and when are you going to do that? The Spirit of God has been crying back out, I'm waiting for you to do the things that I've told you to do. I'm waiting on you. You're not waiting for me. I am not slow to fulfill my promise as some perceive slowness to be in the realm of man. The Lord says, everything that I have spoken will be. Cooperate with my spirit. Partner with me. Surrender to me. And the bride and bridegroom together will subdue the earth and bring forth the glory of the Lamb. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Ooh, somebody bless the name of the Lord in this place. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. We're going to see how far. Yes, Lord. The Lord is going to let us get in the teaching this morning. This morning, the Lord is, is going to release a teaching on the Cyrus anointing. And if you've been around this house very long at all, you know, sometimes from this pulpit you get teaching. Sometimes you get preaching. Sometimes you get prophecy. Sometimes we don't exactly know what it is, but we know the Lord's doing it. Hallelujah. Amen. And we just want to be a people totally surrendered to the Spirit of God. I'm going to say something again that the Holy Spirit said at the beginning of the service today. Holy Spirit said this. Intimacy with Jesus is the key that will unlock every door that you've been crying out to Him for. 
Amen. The Lord says there's many in the church right now crying for doors to be opened up. And they're even quoting. They're saying, Lord, you've got the keys of David. The doors that you open, no one can shut. And the doors that you can shut, no one can open. And the Lord is saying this day, I can't open up those doors until you go to a deeper level of intimacy with me. Because the deeper the levels of intimacy that you go with me, the more I can trust you with my precious gifts. And the Lord says, like a, like a dad on Christmas Day, that begins to give gifts to his dad and he starts out with the smaller ones and then he gets to the little bigger ones and then he says at the very end is the crescendo and dad with the big smile on his face pulls out the big present from behind the chair that you couldn't see and with a big goofy smile hands it to you and you unwrap it and you cry out because that's the thing you really wanted. Hallelujah. The Lord says, I'm like that, but every level of intimacy that you go deeper with me, I hand you another gift, a bigger gift. But the Lord says, it's not about the gifts, it's about me. The Lord says, I'm not looking for the generation that seeks my hand of blessing. I'm looking for the generation that seeks the face of the God of Jacob. Why was I so disappointed with Judas in the garden? Because when he finally kissed my face, it was in betrayal. When he knew that I was looking for the generation that would kiss the face of the God of Jacob in intimacy. The Lord says, the deeper you go in intimacy with me, the more I can give you because the more I can trust you. And I'm looking for a generation that I can trust with the secrets hidden in darkness. The Lord says, I'm looking for a generation that I can trust with the treasure buried in the field. The Lord said, I'm looking for the generation that I will call the greatest generation that will walk in such deep intimacy with me that I can trust them with anything. And they look so much like me that the Father can't tell the difference between me and them. The Lord said, that's the generation that I've been waiting for. From before the moment, I said, let there be light. I was wearing the wedding garment even then. And the Lord said, I've been waiting for the generation that's beginning to emerge. I'm waiting for the generation that's beginning to emerge. He said, I've waited for them through Daniel's generation and David's generation, through Jeremiah's generation and Hosea's generation, through the Apostle Paul's generation and John the Beloved's. The Lord said, I've been waiting for the generation that would walk as the five wise virgins and I would be their treasure, their pearl of great price, and they would cultivate the oil of intimacy with me, even in the midst of suffering, because the oil doesn't flow unless the olive is crushed. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Hallelujah. Oh, the prophetic pen is moving this morning, isn't it? All right, I think we're going to go in and out of this word and the prophetic this morning. So, hallelujah. Let's get, just get ready in the Lord. Amen. Mm -hmm. Just put your hands up to receive. Lord Jesus, I just ask right now that you would anoint these hands to receive. Lord, you said these hands that are up right now would do greater things than what you did. They would heal the sick. They'd raise the dead. They'd cast out demons. They would plant and they would uproot. They would build up and they would tear down. Lord Jesus, you said, as you are, so are we in this world. So these hands that are lifted up right now, Lord, may they be your hands. And Lord, these hands are connected to a body. Lord, I ask that anointing will flow from these hands in the body today and activate eyes and ears and voices and hearts and taste and smells. Lord, I pray this day, may you teach us how to be a supernatural people. Lord, I thank you that we're not citizens of, of earth and heaven. We're citizens of heaven and earth. And Lord Jesus, I decree and declare these hands that are lifted up to you today are coming into alignment with you. And I declare during this word today, some hands are going to begin to glow hot. They're going to begin to burn like an iron is on them. Lord, other hands are going to feel wet like there's oil dripping upon them. Lord, I decree and declare an anointing is coming over these hands and mantles are falling right now as these hands are up. Lord, I declare mantles are coming down. Lord, the tail of the mantle first. Lord, and, and the, the arms, the sleeves are, are coming down over these hands and arms that are upraised. You're releasing new mantles in this place right now. And Lord, there are mantles that people have walked in the past like Coleman and Wigglesworth and others. This year, releasing those mantles in greater form right now. Lord, I just saw a mantle of fire that you're releasing over somebody, Lord. You're releasing a mantle of fire 
Woo, I see a mantle of glory is coming down over someone right now, Lord God. But Lord, I thank you that there's mantles that the earth has never seen before. Lord Jesus, that you're beginning to release right now over this generation. Lord, we can't call it a David mantle or a Daniel mantle or a, or a Joshua mantle. It's a mantle the earth has never seen before because you saved the best wine for last. You saved the best mantles for last. And Lord, I decree today is a mantling day in you. Lord, may we shed off the mantle of the flesh. Yeah. And Lord, may we take in the mantle of the Spirit. Yeah. May we trade the corruptible for the incorruptible this day. Lord, may we trade the temporal for the eternal. Lord, this day, may we trade the lie for the truth. Yeah. Lord, this day, may we train the, trade the chains for freedom. Yeah. And Lord, this day, may you put the keys of David in our hands. Your intimacy with you in Jesus' name. Yeah. Holy Spirit, have your way. Have your way. Have your way. Hallelujah. Somebody just say amen. amen. If you've got the word with you, let's go to Isaiah 45 this morning. Actually, we're going to start in 44. Hallelujah. How many are ready to receive the word from the Lord? I guess I should say, how many are ready to continue to receive from the Lord this morning? Because we are in the overflow, aren't we? Hallelujah. How many know that David said, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies and my cup overflows. Come on. How many hear that this morning? There's cups overflowing in this place. Um, normally I have you stand to receive the word, but this morning you can stay seated because... God really just wants to begin to reveal some things in the, to us in the Word this morning. He knows we're already honoring Him in this place. Amen? We're honoring the Lord in this place. I want to talk this morning, as far as the Holy Spirit will let me go, um, on the Cyrus anointing. And tonight we're going to be at Pelly Road Christian Fellowship, my dad's church, the church I grew up in. The Lord lets us go there once a month, hallelujah, on a Sunday night to, to get to be servants in the house that God used to help birth this house. And tonight, if the Lord allows me to get to the pulpit, we're going to talk about seeing into the dimensions of the Spirit. And I really believe this word sets up that word that's going to be released tonight. Hallelujah. So I want you to notice something in Isaiah chapter 44 and verse 24. There are two very prolific people that Isaiah prophesies about in the word. The first was our Savior, Lord, and King, Yeshua, the Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth. In fact, Isaiah releases more messianic prophecy than any other prophet in the Old Testament combined. But then out of nowhere, in Isaiah 44, he begins prophesying about a Gentile, which is very, very countercultural. He starts prophesying about this guy named Cyrus, and he's prophesying about this guy 100 to 200 years before he was born. And the Cyrus that he is about to talk about, his name, hallelujah, in the Persian culture, means one who possesses the furnace. How many know that Nebuchadnezzar stoked up the furnace seven times hotter, and one appeared in the furnace with the three Hebrew boys that looked like the Son of Man? And when Nebuchadnezzar called into the furnace, he didn't ask for four, he only asked for three. He asked for Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. He didn't ask for the one that looked like the son of the gods. But then this man is going to conquer Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom after Nebuchadnezzar is gone and his name is Cyrus, and he's the one who possesses the furnace. We need to understand this. As we begin to talk about Cyrus, we need to get a prophetic understanding of what God is doing at the end of the age. I was spending time with the Lord this morning, and the Lord said this to me. The Lord said, Andrew, you prayed for the Joseph anointing. You prayed for the David anointing. You prayed for the Joshua anointing, the Daniel anointing. He said, just recently again, you've been asking me for the Cyrus anointing. He said, Andrew, what do all these anointings have in common? I said, well, Lord, number one, they come from you. He said, absolutely. I said, number two, they're, they're all from people that walked in the Old Testament, and they're all types. How many know that Joseph was a type of Christ? He was the deliverer, right? How many know David was a type of Christ? He was prophet, priest, and king. 
And the, and, the, and the Lord said, Andrew, yes, you've spoken well. He said, what I'm doing is, I'm not taking one mantle right now and pouring it out over my people. I'm taking all the mantles of the people that were types in the Old Covenant, and I'm bringing them together and pouring them out over my people at the end of the age. He says, it's a culmination or mingling of mantles, and I'm pouring that out over my people right now. I don't know if anybody heard that or not, because that's very exciting. The Lord said, I'm taking all those mantles and I'm pouring them out right now, but I'm pouring them out in greater measure than those who ever walked in than the Old Testament walked in, because those that I'm pouring them out upon now walk in a better covenant. And my blood speaks a better word. Okay, now we're starting to get in the flow. Put your prophetic ears on. Now I want you to notice Isaiah 44, 24. The word says, this is what the Lord says. Let's stop right there. Do you know what the Lord is wanting the church to do right now? To stop listening to what everybody else says. And start listening to what he says. The Lord says, it's time for my church to stop listening to CNN. It's time for my church to stop listening to you. Fox News. He says it's time for my church to stop watching the evening news with Dan Rather. Is he still evening news? But anyway, hallelujah. The Lord says it's time for my church to stop listening to the prevailing storyline. I want them to start listening to the prophetic storyline of heaven. Hallelujah. The Lord says it's time to start listening to the right voice. It's time to start listening to what Adonai says. And screen out all the other voices. Because all the other voices are designed by the enemy to bring a spirit of confusion. And the Lord says, I'm lifting the spirit of confusion off my people. I'm lifting the vagabond spirits off my people. I'm loosing off of my people the wandering spirit. And I'm anointing them so they can root deeply below and bear fruit above. No longer they're going to be tossed to and fro by every wind and every wave and every new speaker that comes into town. God says, I'm giving my people a place of stability. They will dwell in the secret place of the Most High and abide in the shadow of the Almighty. They'll say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. They will walk in the anointing of Psalm 91, verses 1 and 2. Okay. So the word says, this is what the Lord says, Adonai. Adonai, Lord, means someone that we completely surrender everything to. The Lord said to a fellow in the word, in his, in his, men, his earthly ministry, he came up to him and said, Lord, and he said, why do you call me Lord when you don't do what I say? The Lord said, I'm trying to teach the church right now as I speak to them as the jealous bridegroom king that if you love me, you will obey my commandments. If you call me Adonai, then you need to see me as your Adonai and you need to do what I say out of intimacy with me and not religious duty. Mm -hmm. This is what the Lord says, your redeemer who formed you in the womb. Isaiah is speaking like David in Psalm 139. You saw my unformed body as you knit me together in the secret place. He says, I am. Somebody say, I am. I am. The Lord is going to say here four things about himself that we need to understand at the end of the age. Number one is he says, I am the Lord. He says, number two, I made all things. He says, number three, I alone stretched out the heavens. And number four, I spread out the earth by myself. How many have ever read about the third chapter from the end of the book of Job where he says to Job, where were you? When I created the earth. Where were you. When I gave the Leviathan its scales. Where were you. When I moved my hand. And I brought the heavens. Into the great expanse. And with my hands I put the stars. Into alignments. Where were you. Because I'm the one who holds the seven stars. In my hands. And I walk amongst the seven golden lampstands. Isn't that what he said. Who foils the signs of false prophets. He's beginning to deal with the spirit of the Nicolaitans in the church. And makes fools of diviners. The Lord's about to expose the magicians and the fortune tellers for who they are. Who overthrows the learning of the wise and turns it into nonsense. He's about to, woo, hallelujah, make the weak things confound the strong and the simple things confound the wise. We're about to see layers and layers and revelation of the word of God fulfilled simultaneously in the earth. Okay, is anybody getting this? Who carries out the words of his servants, be careful what you speak, and fulfills the predictions of his messengers, be careful what you deliver. Who sits in Jerusalem, it will be inhabited, and of the towns in Judah, they will be built. 
and of their ruins I will restore them. Who says to the watery deep, be dry, and I will dry up your streams. By the way, he's talking there about drying up the streams of the enemy. And the Lord is beginning to dry up the wells, the streams, the cisterns of the enemy. And the Lord is about to release the floodgates of revival. Now, how many know in this passage the Lord is establishing who He is? How many know since we picked up there in about verse 24, He established who He is quite well? Can I hear an amen? amen? He established who He is quite well, and we've got to understand this. Now, out of nowhere, the Lord's going to do something that He really hasn't done in any other part of the Word until He has spoken to Abraham and called him out of the Gentiles to start the chosen people out of him. All of a sudden, he's going to start prophesying about a Gentile. Right in the middle of good Jewish prophecy. So to anyone who hears this, they go, Whoa, wait a minute, hold on here. What in the world is going on? Notice verse 24 or 28. Who says of Cyrus... He is my shepherd and will accomplish all that I please. He will say of Jerusalem, let it be built. And of the temple, let its foundations be laid. Now we've got to understand this. God is prophesying about Cyrus 100 to 200 years before he was ever born. So there's got to be a man and woman that come together, not because they had a candlelight dinner and a little bit of romance, but because God ordained at that very Kairos moment in time, a man would be conceived for God's purpose named Cyrus. We've got to understand what God did here. And by the way, the Lord says there are Cyruses all over this room and hearing this word. Your life is not the culmination of mom and dad having a candlelight dinner and a little bit of romance. The Lord said, I could have had you conceived in any generation from Adam, all the way to the end of the book of Revelation, I chose that you would be born for such a time as this. Oh, people of destiny, start seeing yourselves the way that I see you. Not only do mom and dad have to come together and a child be conceived, they have to hear that the child is to be named Cyrus. Is anybody getting this? <laughs> and then he has to grow feeling there's a destiny within him and he's not like everybody else. And then he has to be put into a position of leadership by the Lord. Have a vision beyond the leadership of Media and Persia. Conquer Persia. Merge them into Media. And then go underneath the, the gate. Dry up the waters. The Lord's prophesying how he was going to defeat Babylon. Dry up the waters. Go underneath the gates. And conquer a kingdom that was the head of gold in Nebuchadnezzar's dream. How do I know none of that can be explained the way as happenstance? It was the hand of God. And you're about to see the hand of God in your life manifest like never before. The dancing hand of God, the hand of the Lord's favor, is going to manifest in your life like never before. Is the Holy Spirit speaking to anybody today? If He is, give Him the glory. Just see the Lord in this word that's being released. Hallelujah. And then Cyrus was going to have to hear the word of the Lord and obey it. And then God was going to use Cyrus to set Israel free from 70 years of Babylonian captivity. Now I want you to notice something here because this is so important in the Lord. Right now, the Lord is saying that he's mingling the mantles of those that walked in the old covenant. But he's releasing those mantles in greater measure because they're being released over a new covenant people and the latter glory will be so much greater than the former glory. Grab a hold of this, guys, because the spirit of prophecy and revelation and wisdom are in this room right now. The sevenfold spirit of God is being released. Isaiah 11, the spirit of the Lord, the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of revelation, the spirit of counsel, the spirit of might, the spirit of knowledge, and the spirit of the fear of the Lord. And may we delight in the fear of the Lord, for the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and knowledge of the Holy One understanding. How many receive the word? The Lord says, stop coming to the refuge and thinking the refuge is going to be the way that it's been in years past. The Lord says, behold, I'm doing a new thing. I'm shifting paradigms. I'm tearing down walls. And I'm moving things in their proper place. 
Okay. Yeah. Hallelujah. And if you're part of the refuge or you're visiting today, the Lord said you're here, and I'm speaking that over you also right now. Okay. How many receive that? Yeah. One of the most prolific types in the Old Testament is David. David walked as prophet, priest, and king. What does the prophet do? The prophet hears the voice of the Lord and decrees and declares in God's timing what he says. What does the priest do? The priest stands in the role of intercession and stands between heaven and earth and intercedes for God's people and people that will be God's people and to bring forth God's plan, God's agenda in the earth. What do kings do? Kings sit in a position of authority and they release the Lord's dominion on the earth. And we're at the end of the age and God is releasing the mantle of the prophet his way, the priest his way, and the king his way. And he is bringing prophets, priests, and kings together in the earth to work together to accomplish its purpose, well, the Lord's purpose, while at the same time, he's also given every single one of us the prophet, priestly, and kingly anointing. Now, the Lord is going to anoint you to walk in all three, but there's going to be one that's more powerful than the others that you're going to walk in. But he's called us all to be kings and priests here on earth. Has he not? To be a royal priesthood and a holy nation. How many are hearing this right now? Okay. Let the Holy Spirit speak to you. This is very, very important. So here the Lord prophesies about this man who's going to come forth. He's not going to come forth as much in the prophet anointing or the priestly anointing as he's going to come forth in the kingly anointing. God is moving his people into strategic places at the end of the age. I was studying this word again this morning in the van. Okay, My 18-year-old daughter who has her driver's permit was driving. Holly was in the passenger seat coaching. I was in the back seat praying as the priest interceding. I'm just joking. But you know I love you, baby. So I've got four amazing kids. Hallelujah. Aren't they incredible? But I'm studying my notes. And as I'm studying my notes, I heard the Spirit of God say this. I'm tearing down the paradigms of what my people have believed ministry really is. So they can function as I called them to function at the end of the age. Yes. Hallelujah. Meaning what? The Lord says, I want to break down the paradigm that ministry happens behind the pulpit. And that's the most effective ministry there is. The Lord said, no, this is a place of training, coaching, mentoring, raising up. My greatest work will be done beyond the four walls of the church at the end of the age. Amen. So the Lord says, is, is, is he has me teach on the Cyrus anointing today? Don't look at it and go, well, that's not the prophetic anointing. It's not the priestly anointing. It's, it's like a governmental and position of leadership and authority anointing. It's not even a position in the church. So, no, don't look at it that way. Because this is an anointing that opens up doors for things to happen in the earth so God's destiny can come forth and be released. Amen. I decree and declare, because I believe the Holy Spirit of God is saying this, the greatest ministers at the end of the age will not have a position behind the pulpits. Amen. The Lord is tired of hirelings. Yeah. He wants shepherds. Yeah. I don't know if you heard that or not. Yeah. The Lord said, I'm tired of the hiring, the hireling the career pastor mentality in the church. And I'm raising up a people to walk as prophet, priests, and kings and go throughout the earth. And the Lord says, the one that I set up on the school board in the troubled region where they're teaching gender confusion and transition and lies, that radical believer that I put on the school board seat is a Cyrus and as important as the prophet and the priest to me. Hallelujah. And some of the greatest prophetic work is going to happen outside of the four walls of the church. Okay, We need to understand what God is saying. He says, I'm tearing down the, the paradigms that are holding my people back. Okay. Now we need to understand something. 
Cyrus had a multifold anointing. He had multiple things that the Lord called him to do. And we're going to see in Isaiah 45 that the Lord calls this man, this Gentile, his anointed. The same word that's used for Jesus in the Hebrew, Masach. He calls Cyrus his anointing, a Gentile. That was shocking when this prophecy was released. It was shocking. Because look at, look at the barriers that the Apostle Paul ran into bringing the gospel to the Gentiles. Masak, my anointed one, is used for a Gentile. What is God doing all the way back in Isaiah 45? He's showing that the Jews and the Gentiles are going to come together. Oh, wow. See, the Cyrus anointing is really a picture of what's going to happen at the end of the age is the Lord raises up Cyruses throughout the earth. And the Jews and Gentiles are going to come together to establish the Lord's kingdom here on earth. And then the Jews are going to cry out, Bo Yeshua Bo, come Lord Jesus, come sit upon the throne of David. And then the true, the true Cyrus, the true king, the Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth, will come and start his millennial reign. We are a part of that prophetic picture. You are a part from Pat in the back of the room, hallelujah, and Ben over here to Aaron over here. We're all a part of that prophetic call of the Lord at the end of the age. Stop seeing yourself like Esther did before Mordecai got a hold of her and said, perhaps God has done all this for such a time as this. Stop seeing yourself as a little girl. See yourself is my deliverer, my chosen servant, my Masak at the end of the age. What does Masak mean? It means to smear with oil. So what did the Lord really say about Cyrus? He's the one I'm smearing with oil. And I'm telling you guys, when they anointed in the Old Testament, and they anointed three groups of people, prophets, priests, and kings, they had a large horn of anointing oil. And guys, it didn't look like this. It looked like this. And they would fill it up with oil and pour it over the head of a prophet, priest, or king. Psalm 133, blessed is a place where brothers dwell together in unity. It's like the oil, the precious oil poured on Aaron's head, down his beard, into the collar of his robes. It's as if the dew of Hermon were falling on Mount Zion, for there the Lord bestows his blessing, his presence, his power, his life forevermore. When you got anointed in the old covenant, you got immersed with oil. Is anybody catching this? So here we are in today's church, and we just delicately take a little drop and pink. Put it on somebody's head. You know what Isaiah prophesied? He said when the anointed one comes, he will smear with oil. Because he is smeared with oil. He is the oil. Is anybody hearing what the Lord says? We need to understand this. So Isaiah prophesies about two very prolific people and he calls them both Masach. One is Cyrus, who we know was a man. The other was the Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth, Yeshua HaMashiach. It is very interesting that one of the major callings of Cyrus that gets lost when people teach on Cyrus is this. He was to release Israel out of Babylon so they could go back into the southern kingdom of Israel and rebuild the walls of Jerusalem that was needed for safety. But spiritually to rebuild the house of the Lord. Now it's very interesting that both eyes, that Isaiah prophesied something that we need to understand at this very point. In Isaiah 56, 7, he said, For my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. Then Jesus in Matthew 21, 13 quotes Isaiah. How many know when the Word made flesh, Jesus, who according to the book of Revelation, is the spirit of prophecy, when he in his earthly ministry in the Gospels grabs a prophecy in the Old Covenant and repeats it in the New Covenant that he's establishing in his blood, we better pay attention to it. Amen. And what does Jesus say when he's about to die on Calvary and he throws the money changers out of the temple? 
He said, my father's house will be called a house of prayer for the nations. Why is God raising up Cyrus's at the end of the age? Because God's going to use them to break the bondages off of his people and use them to build the house of prayer. The house of prayer at the end of the age is going to be the greatest house of prayer the earth has ever seen. Amos 9.11 will be fulfilled and I will rebuild the fallen <coughs> tent of David. What was the fallen tent of David? The place where when David brought the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem, he didn't go over to the left where, the, where Moses' tabernacle was and put the Ark in Moses' tabernacle again. He went to the other side of the mountain and he, he pitched a simple tent and put the Ark in that tent. And for 30 years, he paid for prophets and harp and bowlers and singers and folks that read the word 24-7 to worship, praise, decree, and declare around that tent. Amos 9.11, the Lord didn't say, and we've got to understand his heart. He didn't say, and I will rebuild Solomon's fallen temple. He said, I will rebuild David's fallen tent. At the end of the age, the Lord does not want to build a crystal cathedral. He wants a simple tent where his presence dwells. Hallelujah. That's why you're about to see God deal with ministries that are about the crystal cathedral. He wants a simple house where his presence dwells. Give me a leaky warehouse in the presence of the Lord any day. Then beautiful brick and mortar that's dead. Okay. Anybody hearing what the Lord is saying? I'm not picking on anybody. I'm picking on a system. And the bride of Christ was never created for a system. She was created for the bridegroom. That's why he's saying to his church, come out from among her. He's calling his remnant out. And he's saying, come out from among them, be ye separate. The Lord said, I'm about to do something you've never seen me do before. Somebody bless the name of the Lord in this place. So, we've got to understand that this call for the Cyruses is multifold and multidimensional. But we're going to talk more about that in a second. One of the things that we have to realize about Cyrus was he was a conqueror. He was a conqueror. Very interesting that Nebuchadnezzar conquers a lot of nations, and he brings Israel prophetically, fulfilling the words of Jeremiah, in the captivity for 70 years. Why 70 years? Because when the children of Israel went to the promised land, the Lord said, I want you to follow the Sabbath principle on the land. For six years you will plant, the seventh year the land will grow fallow, in the eighth year, the year of new beginnings, you will plant again. And the Lord said, if you will follow my system, at the end of the sixth year, you're going to harvest such an abundant harvest that in the seventh year when the land grows fallow, you're still going to have abundance. And in the eighth year, when you begin to harvest the crop of the eighth year, you're still going to be eating what you harvested in the sixth year. It was the Sabbath principle of the land. Israel went into apostasy and they ignored 10 cycles of that Sabbath principle. So the Lord said, okay, you ignored my Sabbath principle for 10 cycles, 7 times 10, 70 years, you're going to go into captivity for 70 years. Is anybody hearing this? Okay. Now, Nebuchadnezzar defeats nations like Israel and brings those nations into captivity. Cyrus breaks the chains and releases Israel to go back into the promised land. But he was also a conqueror. He conquered 12 different peoples. And by the time he was at the end of his reign, are you ready for this? Because this is very, very important. He conquered over 16 different nations. 12 is the number of God's government. 16 is the number of God's direction, directed in his love. That's who Cyrus was. See, those that are being raised up in Cyrus's at the end of the age, they walk in a conquering anointing. If you're a Cyrus, God is anointing you to bind up the things of the enemy and to loose the people of God. Come on. It's Isaiah 61. The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach the good news of the gospel of the poor. He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to set the captives free, to set at liberty those who sit in darkness, to liberate them from dark prison cells, the blind, 
to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of the vengeance of our God. To give them what? A crown of beauty instead of ashes. The oil of joy instead of mourning. And a garment of praise in the place of depression, oppression, and despair. The Cyrus anointing parallels the Isaiah 61 anointing. Now we also need to understand this about Cyrus. The position that God put him in initially was not the position that he was going to stay in. Because he came up in the media Persian Empire as a leader, but then what he did was he conquered the Medes and established the Persian Empire, and then he went after the Babylonian Empire to destroy it and bring it to an end. What does Babylon represent? Babylon represents the world. It represents the occultic system. It represents Jezebel the harlot. Is anybody catching this? Yeah. You want to know one of the reasons why drugs are so addictive and they bring such a spiritual bondage in people's lives? The majority of the drugs that are taken today that are hallucinogenics were created, were invented in Babylon. And they were invented as part of demon worship. So people would have visions and they would see things. We've got to understand that. That's why when people take drugs, there's a witchcraft curse that comes over them. That's why it can be so hard to break that, that spirit of addiction. Pharmakia is what that spirit is. You are battling witchcraft when you're coming against the spirit of addiction and somebody in your family. So we've got to understand that. But how many know Numbers 23, 23 says divination has no power over Jacob and witchcraft has no power over Israel. Okay? We've got to be careful what we take into our bodies. Somebody bless the name of the Lord. Okay. So I want to put something out here that's very important. The Cyrus anointing today is an anointing of God's, for God's people that are called to go into the marketplace, that are called to go into government positions, that are called to go into the military, that are called to go into the media, that are called to go into some very unexpected places. Isn't it interesting that God sent Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah into Babylon? Why did he do it? Because he wanted to make him his name known to Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonian people. See, Nebuchadnezzar thought he invaded Israel. Israel invaded Nebuchadnezzar. Is really what happened for us to get this. And that same anointing is part of the Cyrus anointing, where God is putting the Cyrus anointing on Daniel's, Hananiah, Mishael's, and Azariah's, and he's sending them into the marketplace. He's sending them into the media. He's sending them into the government. He's sending them into the local government, the state government, the federal government, even world leadership. That ministry is every bit as important as the apostle, the prophet, the pastor, the teacher, and the evangelist. Hallelujah. Every bit as important as that. God wants to break the paradigm that real ministry is when you're called pastor so-and-so. Or prophet is so-and-so. The Lord said, no, that's a title. And there's a lot of people with titles that don't know how to minister. And the Lord said, there's going to be a whole lot of people that minister at the end of the age that don't have a title. But I know who they are. Okay. We've got to begin to understand what God's doing. And he's breaking all of the church and religious paradigms. He's raising up a remnant church that's going to walk like... <laughs> the church has never walked before. You've heard me say this before. I believe the church at the end of the age is going to walk like no other church the earth has ever seen before. Now, why is God sending Cyrus into the marketplace, the government, the military, the media, the banking system, the financial system, the governmental system? You want to know why? He's invading that system through his people. Mm -hmm. And the day is coming when the church is going to lead Babylon is going to lead the world in arts, in music, in film, in finance, yes. in government. Yes. There is a shift that's coming as Cyruses come into their positions of authority. 
as placed by the Spirit of God. But if you don't believe starting today with this word, this breakthrough word, that the Cyrus anointing is every bit as important as the apostolic anointing or the pastor anointing, it's every bit as important, if not more, what the Cyruses are going to do than what the fivefold is going to do inside the church building. Where did the majority of Jesus' ministry happen? It wasn't in the temple. It was in the fields and the streets and the highways and the byways. That's why when Jesus said a, a king wanted to have a great feast and he invited people and then when it was ready, he invited them to come in, but they said, I'm too busy and I'm doing this and I'm doing that and I can't come. I've married somebody. I've bought land. I've done this. I've done the other thing. The king became angry and what did he say? Go into the highways and the byways. And invite them in. The end times revival. The Lord says every revival up to this point. Has been like a man putting his hand on the faucet. Opening up and a few drips come out. The Lord said the last and greatest end times revival. I'm putting my hand on the spigot. And I'm opening it up full blast. And every revival in history. Leading up to the final and greatest end times revival. All just had a little piece in part. Of what the end times revival is going to look like. They were like seed that went into the ground that's bringing forth the greatest revival that the earth will ever see. Joel chapter 2 will be fulfilled with Amos 9-11. Now, God is going to invade all these different pillars with his Cyruses. And what are Cyruses going to do? God is going to give these Cyruses supernatural wisdom and favor in finance, to influence nations, to deliver people from captivity, and to make God's name known. What am I calling this today? It's the Cyrus calling or the Cyrus anointing. And remember how the Lord says, I'm merging mantles? This Cyrus anointing merges with the Issachar anointing. See, because those men from the tribe of Issachar that helped establish David in his prophetic kingdom, the word says these men came from the tribe of Issachar. They were always known as the scholarly tribe. They knew the word. They were the lawyers. They were one of the, th the, the three tribes that marched in front of the tabernacle in the wilderness. Judah, Issachar, Zebulon, and then the other nine tribes in order. Judah, the praise tribe. Issachar, the word tribe. The prophetic tribe. See, these men from Issachar came to David to help establish him in his kingdom. Now, isn't this interesting? What a prophetic parallel. David is going to be established in his kingdom. He's been anointed by Samuel. Men from Issachar come to help him get established as king. And the word says they understood the times, they understood the seasons, and they understood what to do. God is raising up Cyruses in the spirit of Issachar that are going to understand the times, they're going to understand the seasons and what to do. And he's going to give them the resources to help establish Jesus in his millennial reign. Okay, is anybody catching this? This is incredibly important in the Lord. If you're wondering, okay, Pastor, where are you getting this Issachar anointing from? It's 1 Chronicles 12.32, if anybody's a note taker. Okay, so we've got to understand this. Now, God is merging. I keep saying this because Holy Spirit wants us to get this. The Joseph anointing and the Issachar anointing and the Daniel anointing and the Cyrus anointing. You might notice I just threw Daniel in there. You want to know why I threw Daniel in there? Do you know who the prophetic intercessor was behind Cyrus? Daniel! Anybody ever read the book of Daniel? Daniel says, I was in my noon prayer time facing Jerusalem and I was praying and I was reminded by the Spirit of Jeremiah's prophecy that Israel would be in Babylon for 70 years. And he starts praying for Israel. You know who he also started praying for in the Spirit? The man that God was going to use to bring deliverance to Israel. And as Israel got towards the end of the 70 years, they kept waiting for who God was going to raise up. They were praying for Cyrus. Every major man and woman of God that God has used in a powerful way in the fivefold over the years, over the decades, over the generations, always had a prophetic intercessor behind them. 
They were the power behind the throne, so to speak. Many of them had these folks. There's a major anointed prophet and evangelist that went home with the Lord several years ago that if I mentioned his name, everybody would know who he was. He had a woman in his life called Mama Nash. And Mama Nash, in her old age, came to him and said, at the very beginning of his ministry, in her old age, said to, said to him, I am called to be your prophetic intercessor throughout your ministry. She became his prophetic intercessor, prayed for him day and night, and she was a major reason why God was able to use him the way that God used him. And that man was quoted as saying, when Mama Nash died, his ministry was never the same. See, Daniel, who prays morning, noon, and night, and who was like a Cyrus, because he was in Nebuchadnezzar's governmental system. Is anybody catching this? Was praying for Cyrus to come and bring deliverance to his people. And Daniel would be alive through the lives of multiple kings in the area of Babylon or Iran, interestingly enough, Iraq and Iran, in that area, and he would live all the way in the lives of Cyrus. Why would he do that? Because I believe one of the reasons why was not only because he lived holy and he honored the Lord, he was Cyrus's intercessor, whether Cyrus ever realized it or not. Okay? I believe the intercessory calling is for everybody in the church. We're all called to be intercessors. Some will be in the office of intercessor. I mean, this is what they do. But how many know we're all called to intercede? It's part of the priestly role. Okay. Anybody hearing from the Lord this morning? Anybody hearing the Lord from the Lord? This is important. We're living in the most exciting time in the history of the church because we're living in the time where all the prophecies that were prophesied by the, the, the major and minor prophets in the Old Testament are beginning to come together and manifest in fulfillment. The Lord's been watching over his word for this generation to come where all these words would be fulfilled. He says, I'm not slow in keeping my promises as a man is. He said, I fulfill my word. I carefully watch over my word to fulfill it. Guys, he's been waiting for our generation. I don't think you heard that. He's been waiting for our generation to rise up. Part of the rising is in the Cyrus anointing. And he's looking for people that will go, man, I always wanted to be a pastor and pastor this big church and do all this church stuff to say, Lord, I'm willing to lay that down at your feet. And Lord, I'll take the mantle that you want me to take. Yes. And I'll walk as you want me to walk, even if it's a Cyrus, not really truly, fully understanding all of this God, but God, I'm willing. How many know faith precedes understanding? Mm -hmm. Amen. Mary said to Gabriel, let it be unto me according to thy word before she even really fully understood what was going to happen. Mm -hmm. And the Lord is looking for a generation intimate with Jesus that's going to say, Lord, let it be unto me according to thy word. Can I hear an amen? Yeah. Now, let's go to Isaiah 45 and I want you to see this. This is what the Lord says, hallelujah, to his anointed, his Messiah. Amen? How many know that God's anointed are in this room right now? Amen. God's anointed are listening into this broadcast. Okay? God's anointed are being raised up right now. The Lord said the day is coming when the dead will hear the voice of the Lord and they'll arise and come out of their graves. Guys, right now, dry bones are hearing the word of the Lord and they're coming to life. Amen. And we think the dry bones are the world. Oh, no. The dry bones are in the church. Amen. It's where all the people have been hurt and wounded and leadership has devastated them. They have unmet needs, unmet expectations. They thought God was going to do this decades before he did. Right? And they're sitting there and they feel like dry bones. Son of man, can these dry bones live? Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know, Lord. Only you know. Probably sitting in King James. Thou knowest all things, O God. You know what the Lord is saying right now to his people? Speak to the dry bones. Encourage them. Speak life over them. Release prophetic word over them. Release my words over them. Dry bones, come to life and live. Hallelujah.
Hallelujah. I want you to notice what the word says. This is what the Lord says is anointed. Messiah or Masak. To Cyrus. He says, number one, he said, Cyrus is my anointing. He's my anointed one. He's my chosen one. God is showing right away in Isaiah 45, he's chosen Cyrus. And Cyrus is his anointed, even though he's not in the line of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. He's speaking through the Cyrus prophecy that the Gentiles would be grafted into the vine. And he speaks it over and over again in the, in the Old Covenant. How many know there's two times in the line of Christ where the line of Christ was in jeopardy and the Lord brought in a barren Gentile woman, opened up her womb, and brought forth a child through her, including Ruth, who was married to Boaz, the great grandma of King David. So we see throughout the word the promise that the Gentiles and the Jews would come together and be one people prophetically. What is happening right now? We're coming to the end of the age of the Gentiles. The great end times revival is going to end with the end of the age of the Gentiles. And we are going to fall so in love with Jesus as the Gentile church that we're going to stir the Jews to jealousy. And they're going to turn to him. They're going to fulfill Zechariah 12.10. And I will pour out over Israel and over Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. And they will look, they, whoo, hallelujah, they will look upon me whom they pierced. And their eyes will open and they will recognize me. And they'll long for me as one longs for an only son. Why? Why? Why has that not happened in fullness yet? Because the Lord is waiting for the Gentile church to fall so in love with, his, with him that we will stir Israel to jealousy. I'm going to say this, it hasn't happened yet because the church isn't that much in love with Jesus yet. We're very familiar with the Messiah that we don't know. And the Lord says, through intimacy, I want you to come into my pleasure garden. I want to take my church through the song of songs. I am my beloved's and my beloved is mine. And my church is going to walk in such levels of intimacy with me that Israel will be stirred to jealousy. And then I'm going to come. How many are catching what the Lord is saying? So number one, the Lord says, Cyrus is my anointing. Number two, he says this. He says, whose right hand I take hold of. What's that a picture of? Intimacy with God. I'm going to take hold of his right hand. I remember when my daughter Hannah was just a little one, just a little girl. Dad could do nothing wrong in her eyes. It was a wonderful number of years. Dad, you know what I'm talking about? You know what I'm talking about? And we'd walk along and we'd get out of the car at Walmart or somewhere and I'd come over to her and I'd just take her little hand and she'd hold on to mine and we'd walk through the parking lot. Parents, you know what I'm talking about? Absolutely beautiful time in the Lord. You know what the Lord intimately said of Cyrus, a grown man in a king who conquered 16 people, or 16 peoples? He said, I'm going to take him by the right hand and lead him. That's intimacy. Right? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He does what? He leads me in the green pastures beside still waters. He restoreth my soul. He prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy will pursue me all the days of my life. And I will pursue the house of the Lord forever. How many are hearing the voice of the Lord this morning? So the Lord says, number one, he's my anointed one. Number two, I'm going to take him by the hand. Which means what? Cyrus is at the end of the age of the Lord's anointed. And they're going to walk in intimacy with him. And he is going to take them by the hand. That is mentioned as the first two aspects of the Cyrus anointing. Because without them, you'll never walk in any of the others. The key to the ministry that God has for you is intimacy with Jesus. The Lord says, no longer am I going to let men and women function in yesterday's anointing. He says, too many men and women are ministering in the church right now, and many are on the circuit, and what they've done is through practice, they've honed the anointing very well. And they've gotten away with yesterday's anointing. But the Lord says, I am going to shut that down. If they will not pursue the oil of intimacy with me, their lamp is going to run dry. This is not an easy word. 
The Lord says, number one, Cyrus is my anointed. Number two, he says, I take hold of his right hand in intimacy. And through that, he says, to subdue nations before him. He's going to conquer 16 peoples. Isn't that interesting? Then to strip kings of their armor. What is that? How many know if you've got a warrior that's stripped of his armor, it's now vulnerable? See, the enemy's army has been very well armored. And God's going to send in the Cyruses to start dismantling their armor. Mm -hmm. Things in the earth that we thought were very strong were about to, about to happen in China. The Lord is saying, I'm going to take the underground Chinese church and bring them above ground. Okay. And the Lord says, I'm going to take the communist government in China and I'm going to make that high place low. Amen. See, the things that we thought were very strong and mighty, God's going to tear down. Yes. Is China still going to show up in strong Jerusalem? Absolutely, but revival is going to rock that nation. Hallelujah. How many are here with the Lord, hearing what the Lord is saying? Mm -hmm. This is not going to be a popular word in some parts of the world. Hallelujah. But I want you to notice now what happens after he's stripping kings of the armor. Those in the Cyrus anointing will open doors. And in the Hebrew, the real translation is not to open doors. It's to open double doors. What's a double door? They're doors of supernatural opportunity. They are doors for God to move in areas where he's never been received before. They are doors to release the power of God where those people are that are most in need. How many know that Jesus said, I didn't come for those that are well. I came for the sick. Right? And Cyrus understands that. God uses Cyrus to break the chains of a group of people that have been in captivity for 70 years and releases them to go fulfill their destiny. I, I think I heard half an amen there. Now, let me tell you something about the double doors. And we need to understand this. Part of the opening of the double doors is the wealth of the wicked being poured out on the righteous. Let me stop you right there. What the enemy did to try to hinder the true reception of the church of the Cyrus anointing and those that are still really supposed to receive it, and he started it decades and decades and decades and decades and decades ago, is that the enemy brought the prosperity message into the church. So that then when the Cyrus anointing was preached on and that God wants to give the Cyruses the wealth of the wicked that he's pouring out on the righteous, that many in the church would go, oh, there's that prosperity message again. Mm -hmm. There it is. No. See, here's the thing. The prosperity message has taught you that God wants to give you a mansion and five cars and a motorcycle and a yacht and this, that, and the other thing. And when the world sees that, they'll see that there's a God. Baloney. <laughs> Where did that stuff come from? I'll tell you where it came from. This is what we have to understand. Cyrus understands that God is giving him the wealth to use it to, to fund God's kingdom purpose at the end of the age. And true Cyruses will tithe an offering very large amounts of what God gives them and live on very small amounts. Mm -hmm. Because they'll realize that part of the Cyrus anointing is taking 95% of what God gives them and pour it into the kingdom mm -hmm. and live very basically on 5%. Mm -hmm. Does anybody catch this? See, that's the exact, that's a stark contrast to the prosperity message. Mm -hmm. But what the enemy did was twisted part of the Cyrus anointing decades ago. So when it was time to step into it, we'd go, oh wait, that's such unbalanced teaching. Yeah. No, the balanced side of it is he's anointing the Cyruses because he's got to flow the finance through someone. Yeah. Who's going to fund the missionaries? Who's going to fund the translation of the word into the remaining languages that need to be translated? Right? Who's going to build the houses of worship in these nations where churches are springing up? Who's going to send out the first responders when things happen? Who's going to feed the poor? Right? Who's going to clothe the naked? God's raising up the Cyruses to do it. They look at wealth not as their Jesus. They realize they have wealth because of Jesus, and it's to use to pour out on his kingdom. 
But they're at such a level of intimacy with him that they won't go, okay, God, this is mine and this is yours. And this is mine and this is yours. They'll realize they've been raised up in a position of wealth for such a time as this. And the Lord says in the word, the wealth of the wicked is stored up for the righteous. Moses prophesies over the tribe of Issachar and says to them, I'll give you the wealth of the seas and of the sands. What's buried in the seas and of the sands? Treasure. Treasure. The Lord spoke to me a couple weeks ago when I started studying the Cyrus anointing. He said, I sunk ships of evil empires that stood against me. I sunk their ships filled with gold. They buried treasure in the ground and I didn't let them get back to it. And my angels are going to bring it to my people at the end of the age. Well, Pastor, I need biblical precedent on that. Remember when we read Haggai 2 this morning? What did the Lord say? Once more, I will shake the heavens and the earth. I will shake all nations. And then the desire of the nations will come. And then out of nowhere, what does the Lord say? For the silver is mine and the gold is mine, declares the Lord God Almighty. See, the message is there. See, he wants to take the wealth of the wicked and give it to us to fund his end times work. That's right. In some of you, God's going to bring in the full-time ministry, but it's not going to be in the pulpit. It's going to be full-time financing ministry of the kingdom. Amen. Somebody's going to give witty inventions to. How yeah. are you hearing this? See, when we think opening up double doors, we can think a lot of things. Yeah. They're supernatural doors of dimension. They're doors of wealth. Come on. Mm -hmm. They're doors of healing. They're doors of restoration. Mm -hmm. See, the enemy has desperately tried to hold those double doors shut. Mm -hmm. But God is raising up a generation, the Cyrus going through intimacy with him, that are going to open up those doors so the king of glory can come into a generation mm -hmm. and change everything. Mm -hmm. Oh, I hope you're hearing this in the Lord. Mm -hmm. What does the Lord also say of him? I will go before him and make the crooked places straight. I'm going to move, remove the obstacles and the things that are going to get in the way. And then the Lord says something very interesting here. It's all interesting. He says, I will break down the gates of bronze and cut through the bars of iron. See, those that walk in the Cyrus anointing are going to tear down the gates of the enemy. And guys, let me tell you one of the things they're going to do. They're going to tear down the gates of hell and reach in and grab people and pull them out. Because how many people know that there are people living in hell on earth all around us? In the neighborhood around this church building, there's addiction, there's single parent homes, there's kids that were dropped off at their grandparents and mom and dad never came back. We've had some of them in our youth group. Started other families, forgot about them. Right? There's divorce. There's domestic violence. There's gang activity. There's been drug houses a couple streets over. That's in our neighborhood around this building. And they're coexisting with the schools that are right here. The Lord is sending the Cyruses in to tear down those structures of the enemy. To tear down those strongholds. To break the bars of iron and bronze. What did the Lord say to Peter after he said, You are the Son of God. You, you came to die and to take away the sins of the world. He said, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. For this revelation was not given to you by man, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you this, your name is Peter. And upon this rock I will build my church. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. See, hell has gates. Mm -hmm. Every region has a gate. It's a whole other teaching. Yeah. Every region has a gate. Every city has a gate. Mm -hmm. Every county has a gate. Every state has a gate. Every nation has a gate. Do you want to know what the gates are in this region? Just look at where the major issues are, and those are the gates of the enemy. Mm -hmm. yeah. Is anybody catching this? Yes. Sex trafficking, drugs, mental illness, mm -hmm. religion. Is anybody catching this? That's the gates of the city. What are Cyrus's going to do? They're going to go and tear those gates down. Come on. So we've got to understand this. 
It's already happened in some ways in this region. The abortion clinic on Broadway that got national attention because of things that went on there. Groups and groups and groups and groups and groups and groups of Cyruses and intercessors walked around that building. Some from this house. And now that building is a police station. See, the Cyrus anointing disarmed the spirit of Jezebel and death that was in that place. And it's now a positive place for the, for the community. And if we knew who was in that building, there are some Cyruses there. Because Cyruses take away the strongholds and the encampments of the enemy, and they go in and take them over to use them for the Lord. That's why we're going to take the world's music and use it for Jesus, and there's going to be a turnaround. Oh, come on. Hallelujah. Come on. That's why the word says we will possess the gates of our enemies. Come on, Cyruses. How many are getting excited in the Lord? Okay. So we're going to begin to wrap up with this. He said, I'm going to make the crooked path straight, right? Right. I'm going to level the things to get in the way. I'm going to break through the bars of iron. Notice verse 3, Isaiah 45, 3. And Pastor Cindy, we're getting a little hot with the mic here, I think. <laughs> Hallelujah. So Isaiah 45, 3. Thank you, Pastor Cindy. How many just love Pastor Cindy? Isn't she awesome Amen. in the Lord? Hallelujah. He says, I will give you, or I will give the Cyruses, the treasures of darkness, and the riches stored up in secret places. Now, we've already talked about wealth. I don't believe that he's talking about the Cyrus anointing and material wealth here. I believe he's talking about wisdom and revelation that's been saved for this generation and is about to be poured out. The Lord told me once, he said, the greatest rhema, the greatest manna, the greatest wisdom and revelation of the age has been saved for the end times generation and I'm going to pour it out over them. Now it's all going to line up with the word because he doesn't contradict himself. But do you think we have all the revelation in the word? Wait a minute. Well, we could go to the end of the book of the Gospel of John and he says at the very end of his book, he said, I suppose if everything Jesus did were written down in books, there wouldn't be enough books in the whole world to contain it all. We don't even have all the miracles Jesus did recorded in the Gospels. There's not enough room for that. That's how mighty our God is. Hallelujah. I don't think you're excited about him. That's how mighty our God is. Okay, well, Pastor, why do you believe the treasures in darkness and the riches stored in secret places are the hidden rhema and manna of the Lord? Because he prophesied through Solomon. He said, it's the glory of God to conceal, to hide, to bury a matter. It's the glory of kings to search it out. Wait, it's the glory of who? Not prophets. Not priests. It's the glory of it's the Cyrus anointing to get revelation from the Holy Ghost that no other generation has received and pour that which is the greatest wealth out upon the nations. Strategic ways of doing things. Strategic ways of establishing the kingdom. Insight into the word that we've never seen before that the enemy is trying to hold those doors of wisdom and revelation shut because he knows when they open, everything that comes out the church will use against him and he'll never be able to shut those doors again. Amen. Oh, oh, oh. David said, I'd, I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord. Why? Because he knew the power of the ones that opened up the doors. Hallelujah. He was a king, yet what did he say? I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord than dwell a thousand years in the tents of the wicked. See, he understood. How many know the doorkeeper walks in power and authority? But I want you to notice why. So that you may know that I am the Lord and the God of Israel who summons you by name. See, I want you to notice this. In order of being wrapping up with this, he says, for the sake of Jacob, my servant, and Israel, my chosen, I summon you by name. 
Has anybody here ever heard the Lord say their name before? Mm -hmm. Oh, there's nothing like it. <laughs> and it's not like mama when you're in trouble. And you get your full name put out there. It's not like that. When you hear the Lord call your name, whoa. Remember Mary at the tomb? And Jesus is there, but she's so blinded by her own expectation and crushed by her own viewpoint of what she thought would happen and what seemed to have happened. But how do you know what goes on in the unseen realm is more real, more valid, more powerful than what goes on in the seen realm? Yes. So he looks at her and think, looks at him and thinks he's the gardener. Well, how many know John chapter 15? He's, you know, he's the vine and where the branches. The father's the gardener. She was close. And what does Jesus do? He says, Mary. Oh. And her eyes are opened and she realizes who he is. When Jesus says your name, see, we've got to realize that the throne of God, the first will be last and the last will be first at the end of the age. And there's going to be a lot of people that we thought accomplished a whole lot of things from the Lord that are going to have nothing but wood, hay, and stubble. And there's going to be a lot of people that were willing to be unsung Cyruses, that were willing to quietly be intercessors, that were willing to fast and pray for nations for revival to come, who never wrote a book, whose name was never known, who no one would recognize them if you said their name, but they're going to be first at the throne. Because God sees things differently than we do. Aren't you glad? Amen. See, the church is about to receive their true identity in the Lord because the enemy has stolen the church's identity. But God is restoring it back and it will happen no more. He said, I summon you by name and bestow upon you a title of honor though you don't acknowledge me. Now that can be interpreted in Hebrew even though Cyrus, you're not yet saved. You don't yet know me. I am the Lord and there is no other and apart from me there is no other God. This is God's word for you today. I will strengthen you. Then he says of Cyrus, though you haven't acknowledged me. This is important, guys. So that from the rising of the sun to the place of its setting, men may know that there's none beside me. I am the Lord and there is no other. I form the light and create darkness. I bring prosperity and create disaster. I, the Lord, do all these things. See, the Cyruses at the end of the age are going to manifest Jesus to the world. They're going to do it through the kingly anointing, through God placing them in strategic places of leadership in unexpected areas. And they are going to release the Lord's will and destiny. They're going to vote the way he wants them to vote. They're going to stand for him. They're going to sow seed into the kingdom. They're going to be used by God. Even though everybody, you know, in the United States, no pastor so-and-so. The Cyruses God is going to use in a very powerful, powerful way. And they're going to stand before his throne and have crowns to throw at his feet. Now, if I asked anybody in the room today, you know, who feels like you've got an apostolic anointing if this was a big church? How about the prophetic anointing and this is a prophetic house? How about the evangelistic anointing? How about the pastoring anointing? Oh, yeah. How about the teaching anointing? Absolutely. How about the end times financier anointing? Huh? What? Huh? Huh? but some are beginning to get it. Yeah. See, and I've, and I've spoken that over you guys for how long now? Faith comes by hearing mm -hmm. and hearing by the Word of God. See, God is going to raise these Cyruses up. We had an anointed lady from another church call me up, pastor, I know her pretty well. She said, Pastor, um, are you guys still in this location, Windsor, right and forth? And I said, yeah. She said, I'm running for the school board, Harlem, mm -hmm. and can I put one of my signs in your yard? Mm -hmm. I said, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Fill it with signs if you want to. Because an anointed Christian pastor and a woman who's her intercessor are running together mm -hmm. for the Harlem school board. Mm -hmm. They are Cyruses. Yes. 
And what we've got to get away from is this prosperity message. And we've got to realize that finance is very spiritual. It's a kingdom resource. Being placed in a position of leadership is a kingdom resource. All of this is to be used for the building of the kingdom. So right now, you know, if you're not in a pastoral position or a prophetic position or teaching position in a church or in this church, and the enemy's trying to tell you, see, you don't really have a ministry that matters. That's a lie of the enemy. Because maybe God has already placed you in the marketplace as a Cyrus. Come on. You've got to take the opportunities that God gives you. I work for a very unique company full-time in human resources, and then outside of that calling in the marketplace, that Cyrus anointing, I, the Lord gives me the privilege of being a servant in this house. I'm doubly blessed. Mm -hmm. Aren't I? Mm -hmm. How many know Paul made tents mm -hmm. and was a powerful apostle? Yes. See, we've got to understand the way ministry is shifting at the end of the age. So I've got the choice of either going, you know what? You know, I'm, I'm apostolic, I'm this, I'm that, I'm the other thing, is Holy Spirit saying this and all of this, but I'm kind of that like evenings and weekends. Or I've got the chance to say, wait a minute, my work is part of the anointing God's put on my life. Mm -hmm. And it's part of the Cyrus anointing. Because you know what happened? And I, I give the Lord all the glory, honor, and praise for this. I work for a company that's still privately held. It's owned by a believer. At our Christmas parties every year, there's an opening prayer and a closing prayer. One year, they asked me to do the closing prayer. And without permission in the closing prayer, I just made Jesus known. Yes. And at the end of that prayer, did the Arianic blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you. All the executives there, vice presidents, 500 people packed in this building. Just release the name of Jesus and release the word of the Lord. And then I waited. Hey, how's this going to go over? Because they asked me to do a quick prayer and kind of quoted Isaiah 53. And, um, you know, just kind, of, just kind of made the Lord known. A couple weeks later, I'm sitting in a conference room and our CEO sees me in there and comes in and shuts the door. I'm like, here we go. <laughs> it's on. And he sits down and he says, Andrew, you know, the CD of the, of the Christmas party came out. And he said, I wanted that CD for one reason. I wanted to hear your prayer again at the end. Mm -hmm. I went, okay, this is going to go one way or another. Mm -hmm. And he looks at me and he said, Andrew, he said, I'm Catholic, but I'm hungry. Will you teach me the word? He said, that prayer touched me. See, that was a Cyrus prayer from a position of authority in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. And it touched a CEO who would never come to a church service. Mm -hmm. Are you getting this? Mm -hmm. This is the power of the Cyrus anointing. Now, stay in this story because you're going to see Cyrus all over this. And Jack's probably going to watch this message. And he knows I'm talking about him because he lives in Florida now and he's retired. But he says to me, will you teach me the word? And I said, sure. How do you want me to teach you the word? He said, I want you to start a Bible study here at work. And I went, okay. I said, where do you want to do it? In this conference room? He said, no, around the leadership table in my office where all the vice presidents meet, and directors and managers. See, the Cyrus anointing brought me from a human resource generalist position into the CEO's office. To bring Jesus. So I said, okay, yeah, we'll do it, Mayor. He said, and I want you to invite other people from the company. I said, okay. So I put them to invite out, and people start coming. Engineers have gotten saved. People that go to other churches but hunger for deeper word come to this Bible study. Pretty neat. The, our leader of Bergstrom, China, a really neat fellow, Patrick is his name. Um, but he's a Chinese fellow. He came to the States because he had cancer and was going to Mayo's. When he was done at Mayo's, he came to the company I work for, and he happened to show up the day of the Bible study. So our CEO invites him to the Bible study. He gets saved. The leader of our company's Chinese division gets saved and takes the gospel to China in his Cyrus position. 
you see how that wouldn't happen from here? See, the Cyrus anointing goes places where the pulpit doesn't. Anybody catching this? See, this, this is so important. That Bible study now is still going on because he wanted me to teach him the word line by line. So we started almost five years ago. We're in the book of Daniel. <laughs> and now, many of the people that don't attend, there are many of the people that attend work for other companies. They don't work for our company anymore. But we do like a, a ooh, hallelujah. We do like a Zoom. Okay, we use Microsoft Teams. We do a Zoom. And so Thursdays, noon, we're doing Bible study. And now that study, the word is invading all kinds of other companies. Hamilton UTC, Farm and Fleet's leadership team. The word's being released in those buildings through that Bible study. That's the Cyrus anointing. Now, by the way, you know, you know what our former CEO does that now is uh, retired in Florida loving the Lord? He is a part of other Christian organizations down there. And because he is a man who has been blessed with wealth, he is functioning as a Cyrus to help fund those ministries. Mm -hmm. And he pays for our broadcast and our internet every month here at the church. Mm -hmm. See, Cyruses can raise up Cyruses. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. We've got to understand that. See, this is what we've got to get at the end of the age. Cyrus was the most unlikely person that the Lord would ever raise up to do a very powerful thing. Release his people out of Babylon to go rebuild the temple. Do you know what Cyrus did? He provided every bit of funding that they needed to rebuild the temple out of his funds from his nation. Mm -hmm. And you know what else he did? If we studied a little further, and I know the time is kind of ticking by, we'd be able to see this if we went into Chronicles, that when Cyrus makes the worldwide decree across his nation, that any Jews that are under his rulership can go back to Israel very specifically to rebuild the house of God, that the people living in the area where those Jews are living were to bless them with material blessings, to take those blessings with, to help rebuild the temple. Yeah. It was like Israel coming out of the Egypt. Yeah. Plus Cyrus funds this work besides and blesses them and sends them to go. Is anybody getting excited about Jesus? Yeah. Let me say this again, or ask this again. Is anybody getting excited about Jesus? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now I'm going to close with this. My daughter Hannah says, Daddy, always say that three times. Maybe yeah. this is the third time. <laughs> Hallelujah. In 1948, God raised up a president of the United States who was a Cyrus. Anybody know what his name was? Harry S. Truman. From the moment he came out of the womb or was a young boy, his mother, who was a believer, prophesied over him that he was a Cyrus and that God was going to use him in a high position of authority to bless the nation of Israel in a powerful way. See, we think he just kind of felt sorry for Israel, so he used this position to help make them a nation again. No, he had the Cyrus prophecy spoken over him from the time he was a little boy. So when it was time after Hitler's empire was taken down and Israel was scattered and, and that nation had just been, or the Jews were scattered, been so devastated and the nations came together and they wanted to bless Israel because there was a scientist who helped develop some technology, war technology that helped us win that war. And these nations thought, how can we bless Israel because of that? Truman, who understood that he walked in the Cyrus anointing, stepped up to the plate, and just like Cyrus in Isaiah 44 and 45, sent Israel back to their own land. And guess what they're about to do? Rebuild the temple. Okay? 
That's a whole other message in itself. Very interesting. Harry S. Truman compared himself to Cyrus during a visit to a Jewish theological seminary in New York in the late 40s. Eddie Jacobson introduced him by saying, this is the man who helped to create the state of Israel. Truman replied, what do you mean helped create? I am Cyrus. Wow. That is a quote by Harry S. Truman. I am Cyrus. See, he embraced the Cyrus calling. And he knew who he was. Well, how important was that? Let me tell you how important it was that Truman walked in the Cyrus anointing and understood what he was supposed to do. You see how the Cyrus anointing put in a high position of power, President of the United States, intermingles with the Issachar anointing, understanding the times and seasons and knowing what to do. Mingles with the Joseph anointing, being able to protect and preserve the line of Christ. See, that's how all these anointings are mingling. See, in order for Jesus to come back and sit upon David's throne, Israel has to be a nation again. No nation under heaven, after being scattered more than 200 years, ever came back together to be a nation again. Israel came together after being scattered almost 2,000 years. 1948, the impossible happened. Israel became a nation again. Papa's time clock started ticking more quickly. Then they said, you know what? But, 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 Israel doesn't have control of Jerusalem. 1968, a bunch of nations surround Israel. They're going to blow her off the map. Israel miraculously wins through a series of miracles in six, six days. Six, the Hebrew number of man. In the seventh day, they were free. They gained control of Jerusalem. Papa's time clock started ticking faster. See, we've got to understand that Cyrus helped fulfill a major portion of end times prophecy. Can a nation be born in a day? <laughs> yes, they can. So that Israel could be placed back in her own homeland. So that Israel could be stirred to jealousy by the Gentile church. The messianic Believers in Israel would multiply like fire. The Jews and the Gentiles come together at the end of the age. The Jews cry out to the Lord Jesus, come and sit upon the throne of David. And here he comes riding on the clouds. I'm going to argue that the greatest Cyrus anointing is being poured out right now on this generation. It's the Elijah to Elisha. I believe Harry S. Truman was the last Cyrus in that generation. And God is now raising up a new Cyrus anointing that he's pouring out over those that are willing. And there are many going, well, I'm an architect and, or I'm an engineer or I'm a manager or I lead a company, I do this, that, and the other thing, but how much serious work for the Lord can I do? Mighty work! Because you're called to be a Cyrus. And like Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, he sent you into workplaces. He's put you in positions of authority. He's put you on the street corner to preach the word where he knows that person is going to come by that's desperately lost. And you're standing on that street corner as a prophet, priest, and king. And you're releasing the word of God. And that person's eternity is changing. Because God has his man, has his woman in strategic position for such a time as this. How many of you are hearing what the Lord is saying? Are you still here? How many, how many are here this morning? Okay. <laughs> Hallelujah. All right, let's do this. Let's close our eyes in a very non-religious way. Pastor Cindy, would you put on his name is Jesus for us, please. We're just going to take a couple moments. I know we're kind of in the extra innings today. But we're just going to take a couple moments in the presence of the Lord. And there might be somebody in this room, there might be somebody that's listening in that has said to themselves, well, you know what, I don't have the title of pastor 
or prophet or evangelist. And I've always looked at myself as kind of a second class citizen in the kingdom. I'm not called to the big things. The Lord says to you this day, I want you to repent of that. And he says that in love. Because that viewpoint has held you back. He said, I want you to repent before me for saying, Lord, I've got a marketplace call. What's that? The Lord wants you to repent of that and let go of the very words that you've spoken that have blocked what he has for you. And I want to encourage you, if you felt a burning in your heart as the word has been released today, then ask the Lord to pour out the Cyrus and waiting over you. Ask the Lord to pour out over you a kingly anointing. The Lord may have told you, I want you to run for office. I want you to run for the school board. I want you to do this. I want you to do that. But it hasn't been something in the church, so you haven't really thought it's that spiritual. He's setting you up to be a Cyrus. God may give it, have given you an anointing in business. It's so that he can bring finance and through you to finance the kingdom. Now I want you to notice as I've been talking about finance, I haven't talked about giving to this house at all. See, we need to understand finance is a kingdom resource. And he's looking for those that he can pour the wealth of the wicked out upon. But he's also looking for those who want to dig deep into the storehouses of God to receive the wisdom and revelation that he saved, the manifest wisdom of God that he wants revealed to the angels and the principalities and the powers as we walk like Jesus here on earth and they wonder and amaze at how the earth is filled with a bride that's just like Jesus. So I want to encourage you right now to just surrender to the Lord and say, Lord, whatever mantle you want to put upon me in this moment, I say yes. Even if it looks different than what I expected, I say yes. Lord, I repent for thinking the marketplace mantle is not as mighty as the pastoral mantle. Lord, I repent. Lord, here I am. Send me. Use me. Use me. Isaiah heard the Lord say after a mighty encounter with God, who will we send? Who will go for us? He cried out as a young man, here I am, Lord. Send me. I want to encourage you this morning. Say that to the Lord. Lord, no matter what it looks like, I want it. I want it, God. No matter what it looks like. And Lord, if you're calling me to be a Cyrus, I say yes. If you're calling me to be a prophet, I say yes. If you're calling me to be an apostle, I say yes. If you're calling me to be the guy out on the street corner with the music stand as a makeshift pulpit, preaching the gospel, Lord, I say yes. Lord, whatever the call is on my life, missionary, revivalist, Whatever it is, Lord Jesus, I say yes. And then I want to encourage you to pray, Lord, you know what intimacy level with you I need to be at for that to truly manifest. Lord, take me there. I ask that your precious Holy Spirit would take me by the right hand like Cyrus and lead me into the bedroom chamber. Lead me into the chupa to lead me in the pavilion where I encounter Jesus. Where I walk out the song of songs with him. Lord, take me to that place. Lord, take me to that place. I'm willing. Because intimacy with you is the key that unlocks every door. That opens up the destiny that you've put in my heart.
the famous martyred missionary Jim Elliott said before he died on the mission field at the hands of the very people that he went to preach the gospel to. He said, he is no fool that gives that which he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. He is no fool that gives that which he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. Cyrus's, the Lord says it's time. Apostles, the Lord says it's time. Marketplace missionaries, the Lord says it's time. Financiers, the Lord says it's time. Radical, spirit-filled school psychologists, the Lord says it's time. Perhaps I put you in this position for such a time as this. Don't see yourself as a little girl. Don't see yourself as a girl in an adult woman's body. See yourself as my Esther. That I'm sending you to a people that need salvation. See yourself as I see you. You're not just a person that's been through divorce, brokenness, abuse. You're not just a person that came from a dysfunctional family or a difficult background. You are the Lord's anointed. Raised up for such a time as this. The Lord says, I'm breaking the chains. I'm snapping the fetters off. The shackles are falling to the ground. I'm releasing my Isaiah 61 anointing over my people. The Lord said in Isaiah 60, He said, Arise and shine for your light has come. And the glory of the Lord shines round about you. Lord Jesus, I just thank you this day that through your precious blood and the power of your Holy Spirit, we are transformed into what we can never be apart from you. And Lord, this day, whether we're a Daniel or a Joseph or a Mary, Lord, this day, whether we're a John or a Paul, Lord, we all have backgrounds in history. But Lord Jesus, your blood is greater. Greater than any mistake we've ever made. Greater than anything that's ever gone on in man's courtroom. Greater! that all the times we went left when you said go right, your blood is stronger. And your blood speaks a better word. So Lord Jesus, right now I plead your blood over everyone that's hearing this word. And Lord, I thank you that the biggest tree starts out as the smallest seed. Lord, I thank you that that stalk of corn with many years and many kernels started out as one that went into the ground and died so that something greater could come forth. Lord, this day, everyone in this room has a seed pouch in their, across their shoulder and on their side. Lord Jesus, I ask that you would use us to plant those seeds in the right places, in the right positions, in the right way being who you've called us to be at the end of the age. And Lord, may you put the Genesis 26, 12 anointing on the seed. And Isaac planted a seed in the ground and that year reaped a hundredfold harvest. Lord, I ask as the pastors and the Cyruses, as the prophets and the teachers, as the school psychologists, as the home care workers, as the door dashers and ubers in this room go forth with that seed around their shoulder. Lord, may they go forth in the calling and the anointing that you've placed upon them. And wherever you send them, may seed be planted, Lord. May the kingdom be built and your glory come forth. Lord Jesus, at the beginning of this service today, you said, I'm going to release mantles in this house this day. 
Lord Jesus, I ask now that mantles that haven't been released yet, that you wanted to release today, would be released, Lord. Over those in this room, over those listening in, Lord, online, those hearing on the radio, I ask, Lord Jesus, that mantles would fall upon them right now. And Lord, I pray amongst those mantles, may the Cyrus mantle be released. Lord, the Cyrus mantle is going to bring, in one aspect of it, the finances to help release those that are supposed to go forth in the fivefold. Hallelujah. Lord, to raise up training schools, Christian businesses. But Lord, I thank you in the midst of all of that. Lord Jesus, intimacy with you is first and most important. And that's what really matters. Lord, may we be like David who cried out, Oh, to be the doorkeeper in the house of the Lord. <laughs> Lord Jesus, may we all be doorkeepers that you use to open up the double doors so that the realms and dimensions of your glory can be released in the earth at the end of the age. And the Lord says this to you this day. Joshua 1, 8 and 9. The Lord says to you this day, woman of God. The Lord says, do not be discouraged. Do not be dismayed. And do not be afraid. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. The Lord said, do not let the word of the Lord depart from your mouth. He says, I've given you word. I've given you direction. I've spoken to you what I have for your life. The Lord says it's time for you to step out into what I have for you. Do not let this word depart from your mouth, but meditate on it day and night so that you will be successful. The Lord says in everything that you do. The Lord says I am with you and I'm about to take you by a way you've never been before. He says I'm calling you into a shift. I'm calling you into a move. The Lord says, I'm calling you into a new thing. I'm calling you into change. He says, I've already given you my word. Now step out of the boat and walk in it. The Lord says, I'm standing on the water with my arms wide open. The Lord says, you know I put so much greater in you than you've been able to walk in thus far. The Lord says, there's an anointing that makes a way. And I put that anointing in not man's way. Don't look for man to open up the door. The Lord says there's an anointing that makes a way and you walk in that anointing. I'm the one that opens up doors for you that no one can close. I'm the one that shuts doors so that no one can open them. I am your I am. Not them. He says I am your I am. And I am your source. The Lord says, I'm going to take you on a deep, deep, deep journey of intimacy and encounter with me, of healing and restoration. The Lord says, there's a lot of things you've been asking me for, and I've heard your prayers, your quiet, tender prayers in the secret place. And I'm going to show you that I'm the God who hears. And I'm going to bring you into those places you've been crying out to me before. The anointing makes a way and the Lord says, I'm going to bring you into what I have for you in a way that you're not going to feel overlooked anymore. And the Lord says, me being with you isn't dependent on what anyone thinks or says. He says, I am with you. Listen to my voice. Step out on my word. He said, Peter didn't step out on the disciples' words. He stepped out on my word. He says, step out on my word. Trust me. It's going to be different than you thought. Trust me. I knew you before I ever put you in your mother's womb. I rejoiced when I put you in your mother's womb because I put a part of me in the world. And the Lord says, I has not seen, ears not heard, nor your mind ever dare imagine where I want to take you. You haven't missed it. The Lord said, the latter glory is going to be greater than the former.
You know, the Lord was reminding me yesterday as I was spending time with them that man sees things so differently than God does. Jesus sees a man that needs healing and heals him. And the disciples come to him and say, Lord, who sent this man or his fathers? And the Lord said, this wasn't about sin. This happened so that the Son of God could be manifest. <laughs> See, what they saw and looked at for sin, the Lord said, no, he's been waiting to reveal my glory through this man in this situation. And the Lord is saying, there's some hearing this word that you've been through things that you don't think God can bring any glory out of. And you may even think it happened because of what you did. The Lord said, no, this happened that my glory would be revealed. And in your weakness, I'm strong. Hallelujah. <laughs> Just be yoked with me. Me and the strong side of the yoke and you and the weak side. I know what you need. I know what you need. And the Lord says, because I'm the need meter, I'm going to meet your needs. Before I pray, I want to point out something you already know. The Lord says during this word, I've been speaking to people. The Lord says during this word, I've been bringing conviction. I've been bringing encouragement. I've been challenging doubts and fears and lies. The Lord said in this word, I've been speaking to you. You're here today because I wanted you to hear the word that was released. And for people that are going to hear this broadcast afterwards, you're listening to it now because there's things that the Lord wanted you to hear. The Lord says the time is growing short. You don't have time to contemplate over things for months and years anymore. The Lord says when I speak it, I want instant obedience because the time is so short. Instant obedience will bring a very quick manifestation. But you don't have time anymore to think about whether or not you're going to do it. The Lord said, I'm, call, I'm looking for those who will call me Adonai and really mean it. And do it, I say. Love manifested in obedience. Because he said, if you love me, you will obey my commands. So church, faith comes by hearing. And hearing by the word of God. Amen. Amen. Lord Jesus, I just thank you for your presence in this place right now. Lord Jesus, I thank you that when all the other religions of the world come together for what they would call services, they don't have what we have, a true and living God who dwells amongst them. Lord Jesus, I thank you in the service today the true and living God, you, Lord Jesus, Yeshua HaMashiach, the only name under heaven by which men can be saved, the name of Jesus, you came in this room and you're standing here right now. And Lord Jesus, your arms are open and you are salvation. You are healing. You are restoration. You are deliverance. You are the Lord God Almighty. You are El Shaddai. You are the Anointed One. You are the greatest one that Isaiah prophesied about. The God-Man. You're everything that we're hearing in the song in the background right now. And you will be whom you will be. Lord Jesus, this word that we've heard today. Help us, Lord, not only be hearers of the word, but to be doers of the word also. Help us, Lord. Lord, increase, sharpen. Teach us to use our supernatural senses. 
to see, hear, taste, touch, smell what you're doing when you're in the room, Lord Jesus. Lord, sometimes you're in the room and it smells like the rose of Sharon. Sometimes like anointing oil. Sometimes the fragrance of fire. Sometimes the smell of rain. <laughs> but Lord Jesus, I ask that you would teach us as a body to be able to sense where you are in the room and what you're doing and then to do what it is that you're doing. May you be manifest through us, Lord Jesus. Christ in us, the hope of glory. That's what the world needs to see. Lord Jesus, we love you. You love him right now in your own way. Lord Jesus, we love you. Lord Jesus, we love you. Lord Jesus, we love you. We love you, Lord Jesus. We worship you, Lord Jesus. We honor you, Lord Jesus. We bless your holy name. Father, thank you for your love that was poured out on the service today. Lord Jesus, thank you for your blood that you poured out upon us this day. Holy Spirit, thank you for the mantles and the glory that you've poured out over your people today. But I thank you, Lord, that you're not done pouring out mantles. You're going to pour out mantles in Pelly Road tonight. Lord, I just sense that there's just a continual pouring that's going on, Lord. Lord, we live in the overflow. And Lord, I just thank you for that right now. Lord Jesus, now I plead your blood over every word that was spoken in this house today. Over everything the Spirit of God did. And I declare the enemy is not going to be able to steal the seed. The enemy is not going to be able to take or rob from us what you released today, Lord Jesus. But rather, Lord Jesus, I decree and declare in your precious name that the counsel of the Lord will stand. As my brother says, the counsel of the Lord will stand. What you have said will be, will be. In Jesus' name we pray. We honor you, Lord. And everybody said, Amen. Hallelujah.